Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you to the witnesses for your opening testimony. Appreciate it very much. Um, Mr. Chalk, I appreciated your, your comments and um, also uh, your board chair of Solus Power, I believe his name is Neil Desai. Yes, he's made some interesting comments over the last number of months that I wanted to put to you, and I think they're certainly quite in line with what you're, what you're putting forward. He said, uh, the number one issue I see for our country is that our economics don't work. Uh, he went on to say structures in Canada around talent, capital, intellectual property, companies' freedom to operate look very different only a decade ago with entrepreneurs saying that a welcoming and supportive ecosystem put wind in their sails at that time. He then said, but those structures have changed during the last 10 years. The wind has actually been in their face of the entrepreneurs who are trying to do this at scale from Canada for the benefit of all Canadians. Um, and he really describes Canada as having, quote, this weird innovations ecosystem structural problem not seen in other countries where intermediaries such as financiers, universities and business incubators and accelerators are put at the center for validating business. Everywhere else, the business gets to validate business. So with your comments on IP, um, obviously we need a, a very robust ecosystem to support our, the scale-ups that you've talked about. So in light of some of his comments, can you uh, give the committee a few more uh, ideas and for our policy discussion of what the Canadian government should be doing to facilitate this type of renewed ecosystem for entrepreneurs? Thank you very much. That's a, that's a complex question. I'll try to do my very best uh, to, to answer it. I certainly can't speak for... Uh, Neil, uh, decide, but, but um, I, I would say having, having, a, um, having a, the incubators and all the various supports you see for, for uh, small business startups and, and, and what, well, not so much scale up, but certainly startups in Canada is very healthy, is a very healthy thing. And, and we, you see a lot, of, a lot of companies get going. But the, the statistics around success rates of startups are, are pretty, pretty terrible. Uh, you, you do get validation through incubation and, and some of the sort of nurturing that happens there. But the most true validation of a business is from the market. And, and I think that's what we're probably missing. Procurement in Canada is, is, a, is a game where we play not to lose, to quote Ahmad Driscala, one of my friends. Uh, we're, we're not playing to win. Uh, so we're very careful, we're very cautious, and of course it's taxpayers' money, and we should be. But, but I think we need to be prepared to take more risks in, in the procurement. And, and if the Canadian Armed Forces, if this opportunity with uh, the current uh, expansion of, of um, investment is going to, is going to provide uh, the opportunity for full participation across this country, I think we can get a lot of validation that's true to the market, that generate, that builds a lot of scale-ups into bigger and medium-sized companies. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. Gar Garagozali. Uh, I saw you nodding your head quite a bit there, and uh, your opening comments as well, I think, hit on a lot of this. Uh, I think in particular you said we need to rely less on foreign purchasing, rather we need to empower our small and medium enterprises to innovate. Any thoughts? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I'm specifically talking on on the space side, but I'm pretty sure defense as a whole, because uh, even on the maritime domain, uh, we are really relying on, we are, we are becoming a, a purchaser. And again, specifically talking on the space side, uh, Canada just recently signed a contract on Wildfire Sad. Uh, Canada does not have a very active space ecosystem when it comes to contracting active projects. We just signed a Wildfire project, it's uh, phase $150 million, I believe. The company that has that project is an American company and a German company. Uh, and I don't think that's anyone's fault. I don't think um, there are any Canadian companies that are, are put out of that. The reason behind it is we simply do, just do not have those sort of systems that have been built in Canada that can come back and respond to those needs. So we end up basically just going out into the market and seeing what other countries are building and say, hey, can we use your systems? We'll pay for it. And that's very dangerous because um, a lot of these capabilities across all defense domain uh, do need to be, uh, I guess we kind of need to pick and choose which areas we're working with. You know, we have a very strong shipbuilding program. Um, but when it comes to other domains of defense, uh, are we going to just become a purchaser or are we going to put our foot down and say uh, some of these uh, emerging markets, including commercial space, are very raw, 
However, we've got countries like US, Germany is a very good example of that. A lot of G7 countries putting significant amount of funds behind these. And we're just simply falling way behind and we're just going to sit in the back and just become mm -hmm. purchasers. I believe last year you were a witness at Defense Committee and you mentioned, I'll just quote you, quote, we must increase support for the Canadian Space Agency to ensure that research and development is essential. Space capabilities continue to grow. Um, so it sounds like, of course, you would appreciate more support and for that to really uh, support our ecosystem in Canada in the space industry. And of course, the Liberals just announced half a billion for the European space agency. So do you feel that perhaps that money should have been the Canadian Space Agency to better support our local? Or how do you see this working in the grander So that, that uh, $580 million, I believe, uh, that is going to European Space Agency via Canadian Space Agency as we are a con contributing member to that. Uh, that is a very good program. However, one thing about that is you do have to find a European partner to work with to unlock that $500 million. So it's not like we can just go to European Space Agency and say, hey, we, we want to work on a project, and they're like, here's a $500 million project. Um, the problem with that is just finding that European partner in a lot of these cases, because again, we do have a very good relationship with, with European Space Agency. Um, that program is very good if we could be uh, co-aligned with another similar investments that is directly invested into the Canadian com uh, companies to bring them up to a point that they are uh, on the same playing field with the with the German, let's say, uh, or UK companies, because we are simply are not. Right now, if you look at the space ecosystem in Canada, it's it's not a really diverse ecosystem. You've got one or two companies that are generating a lot of uh, products and they have exports. But when you look at the SMEs, that's just a, a, a huge um, unbalance there, if you will. Thank you. So it would be good if that money could be collaborated with the uh, same amount back directly into the Canadian industry as well. Thank you, uh, Madam Dancho. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you to our witnesses uh, here this evening at committee. Uh, Mr. Garagolzi, I'd like to start with you, if I may. Uh, you talked about there being more investment dollars available in the U.S. for venture capitalists and things like that. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a little curious, though, in the process, uh, because we are, we are looking at the whole procurement uh, for the, the department. So y you as a company, a space company, do you have to come up with an idea of a shiny new object that you have to sell to somebody? Do you get your direction from the government in their, in their budget or in their vision as to what's needed? Or does the department come to you and say, this is what we would like you to come up with. Can you develop this? That's a, that's a really good question. I think um, that can come in different formats depending on um, what the direction of the company is. When it comes to defense, it's a, a bit of a tricky area because um, I would say many Canadian companies uh, do not have the classification to be able to have those um, talks with, uh, with our CAF freely to understand what those gaps are, what the requirements are, and then put forward almost a, a proposal and say, um, for example, if you're looking at um, sovereign and Arctic communication systems or you're looking at above ground horizon systems, what are the gaps? Uh, where can we come in and where does that innovation come in? So programs like Ideas come in and they kind of propose this general idea, say, we're looking at enhancing communication. Anybody has ideas. Uh, so that's kind of one stream that a lot of companies kind of look at that and say, and you almost like try to understand what those requirements are on, and you, it's a shot in the dark. And most of the time, they might not be true. Um, in second case, you can kind of look at what other uh, countries are, are doing, what sort of uh, capabilities they have, and can we develop the same things here? Because we certainly use a lot of those capabilities, especially when it comes to Earth intelligence. Um, uh, as well as communication and things like that. We simply do not own a lot of those capabilities, so some companies may look elsewhere and... Buy those capabilities from some of our uh, defense partners. Do we, does it come with source code? Uh, no, most of the time, no. And we, uh, we just kind of buy that as a system, uh, if that. So most of the time, we get access to, let, again, depending on, this, on, the, on, on the platform you're talking about, but most of the time, we just, for example, get access to that data. And in a lot of those cases, those data almost goes through a filtration system to, for example, see if is Canada okay to own that sort of uh, data or intelligence, okay. for instance. Good. Thank you. 
Uh, Mr. Chalk, uh, I'd like to uh, expand a little bit on some of your comments. Uh, your board chair has, has previously stated that there have been a lot of headwinds when it comes to uh, developing products uh, in the last 10 years under this Liberal government. They haven't created an environment for entrepreneurship and in innovation. Startups are very different from, than scale-ups. Uh, when, when you access government money, and, and, uh, and, uh, and you, you talked about most of our IP leaves this country when, uh, for commercial purposes, is there, is there a government uh, opportunity to create equity in these companies when they provide initial funding? Well, I, I would say there is an opportunity. Uh, it's not typically done. Usually it's a loan for, from the RDAs or, or you know, like, uh, like ACOA. Um, that could be a consideration. Uh, one of the things that I see as a problem with uh, the the way it is today is that uh, transitioning from a from a startup to a scale up, uh, the the magnitude of money required to sustain a scale up, your your payroll goes from a couple hundred thousand dollars a month to a million dollars a month or so, and then more, and then sort of the the level of risk that the RDAs and and others are willing to take to invest in you or to, in other words the amount of money. Is, is not there, and there's really no mechanism today that uh, that I know of, uh, maybe the SIF program under I said, but that's not as easy to get either. But Boeing has made a significant investment in your company. And yes. And, and is that because there's government incentives uh, in the United States for them to do that, or is that just because they see commercial value? So, so Boeing gets ITBs when they, when they do anything with us because we're a small Canadian startup. Um, or scale up, but they, all of our business with, with the one exception with Boeing was, was projects on the CH-47 or other things that were, we were doing work that they wanted done. Uh, we were probably one of the only companies in the world that does a harsh environment type wireless power thing that we do. So it's even underwater, we can transfer energy. So, so we've done a lot of helicopter work, most with them. They did it, of course, ITB sweetened the pot, but also we've got last year a $10.3 million dollar uh, in, in an investment framework that was also um, a, uh, a the recipient or made them get the uh, multiplier for the uh, investment framework. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Thank you, Mr. Falk. Thank you, Chair. Um, Mr. Garagosley, yeah, Galaxy has gone further than than most startups. So you launched Mobius One, uh, you secured CSA and and DNSD support. Yet you, you also told the National Defense Committee that the current uh, bureaucratic procurement process still blocks new space firms from fully engaging. So based on your experience, like what specific parts of the procurement process need to be improved so our tech startups can actually scale? Uh, yeah, I think it is still, uh, it requires a significant overhaul. So uh, the, we, we just secured a new contract with the part of the National Defense for our CTOS project. Uh, it's a Canadian tactical operation satellite. Uh, to just give you an example from the time that we were awarded that until we actually got the contract signed, it took us more than, I would say, 14 or 15 months. Uh, that is a forever time in a startup life cycle. Uh, a company can easily go under before they, that contract even materializes. Um, so a big part of that is just, again, these programs are just not designed for uh, the new generations of companies that are coming up. They're trying to build rapidly. They want to iterate as fast as possible. Uh, Again, uh, when you're looking at, for example, U.S., um, almost like every regiment of U.S., like uh, Special Ops or Air Force, even CIA, they have their own almost in investment funds that, you know, from, from an idea until investment, it's a one to three month process. You go, you pitch, you, you, you know, you put your product in front of them and they're like, I like it, here's, here's the first round of contracting. We need to kind of, if you're looking at startups and not larger kind of primes, we need to have a better approach, more like a venture capital approach. Even organizations like BDC, I feel like uh, they are still moving at a, at a government scale and at, at the government pace. Uh, so I think there is a lot to be to 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 learn from um, again a venture venture world to be able to kind of keep up with the startup pace and be able to support their innovation. 
So you've in the past you just you've described uh, Galaxia satellite as software defined with AI on board for real time insights that could be critical for Arctic surveillance for um, uh, NORAD related missions. Yet we continue to hear, as you've just been saying, it, it takes years sometimes to move from demonstrations to deployed capability. So um, if we're serious uh, as a country about faster time to field under the new defense industrial strategy, what specific decisions do you think we should uh, need that need to be taken so we can avoid this becoming just another pilot project for most companies? Uh, I think uh, we need to target, uh, number one, uh, CAF's needs when it comes to defense. So what do we actually need, either in, uh, in maritime, underwater, space, whatever that is? Uh, and then when those companies approach CAF, uh, we can rapidly give them a project and say, here's the phase one. You build it, it takes about a million, but we ensure that that's going to turn into a commercial contract to say, for example, in our case, Right now, if you're building the satellite, it's going to launch in 2027, I believe. But there is absolutely no path after that. We, we're not going to scale this up. It's just a dem demonstration mission. Uh, it's absolutely crucial to have a path forward after that to say, let's say here's a $50 million contract that is going to bring you for the next five years to commercialize this and export it even. So you've also said that um, Canada needs launch capabilities for satellites to be shot into space. So like, what kind of minimum launch capacity do you think Canada needs uh, on its own soil to like credibly claim space independence? Uh, right now, a lot of uh, especially military operations happens within the lower orbit of Earth. That's about 500 kilometers above Earth. Uh, we've got companies like Maritime Launch Services based in Canso. Uh, we've got companies like Reaction Dynamics that are building the hybrid launch vehicle. Uh, they can bring up to two, three, four hundred kilogram of payload into space in in launch responsive format, you can launch them within months. Uh, and that is perfectly fine to respond to what we need right now and to catch up with, with the rest of the world. So we are on the right track, but again, even within those domains, because we work with those guys a lot, uh, you can even in that domain, you can see that the investment is moving slow. I mean, there was a recent uh, uh, commitment of, I, I believe, $185 million to launch capability. So that's a really good sign. But to be perfectly honest, $180 million Canadian is a drop in a bucket when compared to other nations building launch capabilities, space capabilities. So uh, it just needs to be significantly boosted so we can just keep up. Thank you. Thanks very much, Mr. Guggenheim.